To start our discussion of relativity, it's helpful to think about light as a wave and how we use the wave nature of light to investigate the, the way it propagates. For a long time, it was a, a subject of discussion as to whether or not light was a wave or a particle. On the one hand, it was Isaac Newton who conjectured that light was mostly composed of particles. He did so based on the fact that light seemed to travel in straight line rays, or paths much like a particle would take if it was unperturbed by a force. The fact that Newton had great success with his theory of geometric optics supported the particle theory. On the other hand, a hundred and some years later, was Thomas Young who conjectured that light was composed of waves. Thomas Young's famous two-slit experiment, in fact, provided for the wave nature, evidence for the wave nature of light. If light was in fact composed of particles and was made to pass through a barrier with two slits in it, like the example that Thomas Young has suggested, then the light would simply accumulate at a distant screen in two chunks right behind the two open slits. This would be supporting the particle nature if the data came out this way. As we know, Thomas Young did not see that. And in fact, when passing a plane wave of light where blue in this picture represents a minimum and yellow represents a maximum, a plane wave passed through a barrier with the two slits located right here and right here produces wavelets or circular waves emanating outward from each of the, of the two slits such that there are constructive maxima at various locations and there are minima at various locations. And a distant screen located way back in the back would, would observe a, period, a series of maxima and minima as these constructive and destructive interference wave fronts hit the screen. Such provided evidence that, that light was in fact a wave. Most waves propagate in a medium, and this, in fact, was the theoretical bias of physicists well before and well after Thomas Young. We have, for example, waves on a violin string, where, in fact, the medium is the string itself. There's a definite pro velocity of propagation of a wave on such a string, and it's given by the square root of the tension of the string divided by the mass density, mu, where mass density means mass of the string per unit length of the string. That simple square root of a fraction dictates how fast the wave will propagate up and down the string, and it's purely a function of the medium. There's another example of sound waves, where again the definite speed of propagation is, is, a, is found and is related to the medium itself. In this case, the velocity of propagation is referred to as the bulk square root of the bulk modulus, or Young's modulus of the, of the elastic medium, divided by the density rho of the medium. Once again, the waves are required to have a medium or else they wouldn't be propagating at all. As you know, in the case of sound waves, the propagation is through the collision, collisional impact or transfer of energy from particles in the air or the, the solid or liquid. Well, let's think about light waves. Young's experiment showed that light is a wave. And there were a number of experiments, beginning with Romer in the 1670s and Fizeau, who measured light to have a relatively well-defined speed. It was measured at to be a very high number, approximately 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. If light has a definite speed and it's a wave, must it have a medium, much like the other waves that were familiar to physicists at the time? The ether, then, was thought to be the medium through which light was propagating. It was thought that there had to be such a medium, because all other waves had a medium to propagate through. And in fact, even Isaac Newton had conjectured that there was some invisible medium for light to propagate in, because he needed it to, to explain uh, the process of refraction in his particle theory. Reflection works very well when one thinks about particles uh, being responsible for light but not refraction. Even, however, when Maxwell had conjectured that there was light being explained by waves, and in fact it was electromagnetic waves, it was still attractive for there to be something called the ether. The ether could explain how light would propagate in what was thought to be vacuum, or the space between the sun and the earth. The ether could explain why light has a definite value for its speed of c, 
and the ether could explain why all observers would, exp would observe this same value for C, no matter how fast they're moving with respect to the light source or another, toward it or away from it, because all of them are moving or are well defined with respect to some absolute rest frame defined by the ether. Even James Clerk Maxwell, who devised electromagnetic theory in the 1870s, thought that there was an ether. But such an ether would have to have some pretty unusual properties. How come we can't see this ether or feel it? It must not be very dense, or we wouldn't be able to sense it in some way. It also must not be very tenuous or viscous. Even water has a viscosity, making it difficult to travel through. So if we think about something like a Bolt's modulus or a Young's modulus for this medium called the ether, V must be very small. And C, the speed of light, if it's a property of this medium, is an incredibly large number. How It's incredible to think about how, fact, how the, it is a, such a large number when B is small and the, the density rho of this medium must be also very small. So it's kind of unusual to think about an ether that produces such a large uh, characteristic speed for wave propagation through it. So there was real need for experimental confirmation of this unobservable co concept called the ether. It's a fine model, but if we want to use it, it comes at a cost. In other words, it has consequences for other aspects of the theory of how light propagates through it. And consequences mean that we can devise experiments to either confirm, confirm its existence or disprove the model altogether. Maxwell, to his credit, sought experimental tests that would demonstrate that there was such an ether. The ether in this theory defines an absolute rest frame. Everything can move around with respect to the ether at some well-defined velocity. And if you're in the frame of reference of the ether, you are at rest. And if you're moving relative to the ether, you can measure your velocity of motion relative to that. All of these statements, however, have an underlying supposition to them of relative, relativity of motion but it's Galilean relativity, where velocities add. We'll seek then to perform an ex a set of experiments that would confirm that the ether exists and we can measure propagation relative to that absolute rest frame.